guests on my show from all, all genres. Um, we have former law enforcement, ATF, uh, celebrities, and the show is just growing. And I'm, I'm so thrilled. You know, I, I know I have an obligation to use my platform to help people and send out inspirational messages. And I'm going to keep this short because we have a guest who's standing by and she's right there on screen. And I will let you know that she is Samantha Markle. Yes, she is the sister of the Duchess of Sussex in England, or the former, Meghan Markle. So this is literally Harry, Prince Harry's sister-in-law. So she is embroiled in a situation, unfortunately, with her sister. Um, and she'll say certain things, and I'll say certain things. And, you know, of course, we'll do the requisite, allegedly, at least I will. But this is her truth, and she's come to us with a lot of evidence about her side of the story. And her attorney, Peter Tickton, is helping her. There's currently a lawsuit in the uh, United States District Court for the Middle District of Florida. It's called a diversity lawsuit because depending on where people live, they have to decide where to file it. So here's a copy of the complaint. Now, this, this complaint against Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex, uh, filed by Peter Tickton. He's got a law firm down in, in, the, in Florida. The Tickton Law Group. He's also represented Donald, Donald Trump on litigation. He's friends with Donald Trump, wrote a book about Donald Trump. Phenomenal guy, wonderful guy. Um, and this case is very, very troubling because it goes to the heart of statements that Meghan Markle has said, really, that appear extremely disparaging against her own family. And a lot of investigations have been done over these comments recently, and many of them come up with their dis their lies, and we don't know why. We don't know why Megan's doing this exactly. There's many theories out there. Samantha has some insights. And so we are really trying not to take sides here, but Samantha has a very compelling story and tons of evidence and photographs that have never been seen before or heard before that you're going to hear for the first time on this broadcast. I'm very grateful to have you um, on my show. It's a growing show. And I, although I have big fans from my A&E show, Inmate to Roommate, um, here I'm still a, a work in progress. And Samantha, with that being said, thank you so much for agreeing to come on my show. Wow, William Steele, thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here. Thank you, really, wow. You're, you're, you're more than welcome. Now, you know, we have get, been getting to know each other. We, you know, we talk for hour after hour after hour, and you've shared some really uh, interesting insights and sent us a ton of proof and evidence uh, backing up everything you've said. So I appreciate that. Now. I want you to, for my audience, before we get to the litigation issues, and I know there's some you can't get in depth in because upon advice of counsel and they're in court, so you don't want to say too much. You want, you want to speak through your lawyers. I know you've indicated that you regret that it got to this stage, but enough is enough. You know, things that were going on, enough is enough. Um, I will say this for the record, Samantha. I was, I don't know much about the royal family, but I know, you know, Diana, Princess Diana was beloved even by people here in America. And uh, we see the horror that, you know, her passing and the heartache it caused for Harry and her, you know, and for William. And as they were kids and everything. And, you know, we've been reviewing some of that footage recently. It's so heartbreaking. So these are people that have been in the public eye and traumatized terribly. And I think emotionally, no, no matter how tough Harry is because he's a soldier, he probably still has a very, uh, uh, I'm not a psychologist. I know you are, but he's probably very vulnerable in some ways. And so... It's just uh, we wish the best for the royal family, for Harry and for and for Megan. And we're trying to help you get this story out. Please, for my audience, tell everybody exactly who you are, where you're from. And more than that, your your I want to say your professional credentials, because they're extraordinary and they've been discounted or people are saying they don't exist or you're, you're not in your right mind. We've done our homework. You're in your right mind. You're very, very articulate. Let's hear from you. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Samantha Markle. I was born in Markle in 1964, even though PR out there has been all over the, you know, the map with trying to create a sense of separation since this whole thing began. Um, what, what I think has been most shocking for our family is that we were a pretty normal family, even though we are older siblings. Um, my sister was born at the hospital, brought home to our house. And for us, it was a wonderful, beautiful thing. But since the wedding and 
FDR decided to go crazy about creating a separation of family for what seems like a very pointed reason. Um, we were kind of in shock and cognitive dissonance because you know, we believe that we were a loving, pretty normal family, even with a difference in age amongst us as siblings, um, to all of a sudden have the media suggesting that you're not family, have the media suggesting that you're not credible, have the media almost eradicate your existence uh, was very shocking. I mean, I never thought that something like that could happen in this day and age. Right. So all things considered, yes, I do have two master's degrees. One of them is in counseling, mental health counseling. One is in voc rehab counseling, which is why this, you know, even for me, this has all been so strange because I had to learn the power of groupthink, dynamics, of social perception, of social labeling. And I never thought I would find myself in a situation where the media are defining me the media are deciding whether or not I'm credible. They're putting bold font headlines um, into articles that are so far from who I am and who we are as a family that you kind of, I, I went into a kind of a state of shock. I think we all did. And when it becomes so big with aggregate news that newspapers around the world are deciding who you are, no matter what you say, and you're, you know, you're just sitting back trying to trying to set the record straight every day. No, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is us as a family. And nobody's listening. They're going to decide who you are. You can't fight that. You can't fight it when there are million dollar, multi-million dollar PR firms paying to shape a social narrative. And I felt like we were back in the 1600s when people were burned at the stake. No matter what you say. You can be a prominent school teacher. You can be someone who's affluent in the community. But if someone cries witch and that person is wealthy and that person decides to socially label you and villainize you, you're pretty much done. It's a character assassination that may as well, you know, it's like you've got a body, but your character has been assassinated. So you may as well not even be alive. And that's what, ha what happened to our family. So as a counselor, I just thought, wow, I never thought this was possible. I thought we evolved out of this. Right. And here we are. So uh, you grew up, now. I saw the pictures that you shared with us and uh, other ones are public, but some you shared with us that are very private. Um, you're very close to Megan. She's on your lap. You guys are going to the mall. She's at your graduation. Even after she was famous in her own right, I believe she was, she, you guys were still close. You gave her her space. Um, you know, big sister, you wanted her to live her life. What do you think started this animosity, the separation that maybe she feels for you for some reason? And, well, and dad, it's almost heartbreaking because I do want you to tell my audience who your dad really is because he's been portrayed horribly as well. And yet I understand he's won two Emmy Awards. Right. So. Okay, so, you know, more than that, we loved her. We loved her. You know, I mean, children are a godsend. So when she came into our lives, Eagly, Bounty, Wonderful, we loved her. And we couldn't foresee a rift. You know, in Los Angeles, people get busy. They have their lives. And I think in most households in America and most of the world, even as older siblings, you might have a job, you might go to school, and the younger child is in school all day, but you're still family. You come together at the end of the day, sometimes when you can, if you've moved out of the house on the weekends, at the holidays. And so I would say we were most integral in her life until she was 12, her formative years, which are significant and important. And therefore we always felt like, even though her parents were divorced, we felt like there was a bridge between the two households. And we were always about 10 or 15 minutes away and we never wanted her to feel and her mom and dad made it a point to make her feel as though she had two households, one family, double the furniture, double the household material things, but one family that was there for her. So we never thought that there was a rift or anything odd because it was very focal. 
that we be a family and we do the best we could with our life schedules. We weren't silver spoon kids or a family. So working and going to school was like it was part of our course. And you, when you live your life like that, you don't feel like you're any less family because of those schedules. Right. It's just life. And um, I think my dad was pretty shocked because he was the consummate dad, uh, building stages that she danced on, giving us everything we had, working 70 hours a week sometimes, but making sure that we had 100% of what we needed and 99% of what we wanted. And especially Megan, because he did have more money you know, at his disposal by the time she was born. But all things considered, we were all very well taken care of. So when the media started calling him a deadbeat dad and creating a riff, we didn't know where that was coming from. And so people were criticizing us, like, why, why is your family out there speaking? Do they just want money? No, we're out there speaking because we, we see these articles being created that are creating a false riff that are creating separation, that are disparaging us um, and, and minimizing who we are as people. And we've all worked very hard in spite of a lot of difficult life circumstances. For me, it was disability. But nonetheless, I think we all did very well. And so for the media to put this cloud on our characters, I thought, what is wrong with this? How can this be? And moreover, I thought, where is this coming from? So. I mean, it, it, it's, I, I don't think anybody like, you know, I want to ask the people out there, if someone in your family all of a sudden got rich, said they didn't know you, said they had no relationship with you, and more than that, you found out that there was PR out there purposely disparaging you for no justifiable reason other than to create the perception of distance. So we wanted to get at the bottom of what that reason could be. And in the media, over time, we saw a lot of lies coming to the surface that she had told, that she didn't need to tell. There was nothing that we knew of that was, you know, notably um, warranting hiding. But still, for some reason, that wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough to be a normal young woman from a hardworking family that was just upper middle class. It seemed like it wasn't good enough um, to have dad pay for all of her schooling. It seemed like she wanted to take in all of those accolades and hog all of that to herself as accomplishments without paying tribute to dad for everything that he had sacrificed and everything that he had done. I remember you said that he even did lighting at some of her school shows or when she was at, at all of them. He built the stages. He paid for her acting classes or dance classes. He was always there. He was always the one holding the camera. That's far, that's far from that beat dad, especially for somebody who became so successful. And especially when the schools were $150,000 plus. So to, to pay for every penny of her education from her first day in private kindergarten, through her last day at college graduation, to be there, to be involved hands-on, to be um, just an amazing father. Like, I, I don't think, and I've never met a father who can give more, you know, and I, I'd like to see someone in the audience. Uh, I'm sure there's so many men out there who know how that feels. And women too, it's not just men. But as a parent, you know, you do that, you don't want anything back but you certainly don't understand. And it, it's really hurtful to be uh, eradicated and, and just, you know, disavowed and trashed in, in, you know, in spite of everything that you've done, regardless of everything that you've done. You can't make sense of that. So it's been really shocking. I know one of the horrible stories about your father. You know, I think he was uh, one of the paparazzi, saw him buying beers and then called an alcoholic. Yet those beers were for security guards at a place where he was. And right. He doesn't even drink. Your father doesn't even drink. Yet the media disparaged him 
you know, like, <laughs> so, oh, like, yeah, and there are a lot of journalists he's met with who can attest to the fact that they bring him bottles of wine from around the world and he doesn't drink them. You know, he gave those security guards some Heineken beer as a way of being chivalrous and saying thank you because in Mexico, the security guards can't get that. So it was, it was his way of saying, go home and enjoy yourself at the end of the day and thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, but paparazzi got him and spun a story that said, you know, he's an alcoholic. And then, and then after that, we see television hostesses um, like Sharon Osbourne saying, he's clearly an alcoholic. Wow. And I just thought, wow, did you hear what you said? You know, uh, and, and she's had her uh, handful of life challenges with substance abuse. But to call a man an alcoholic that you know nothing about was really shocking. So I thought, you know, there's something to all of this. Why are people in the media jumping on this bandwagon, falsely judging and disparaging someone they know nothing about? This is really cruel. It really is like a feeding frenzy. What, uh, what, what have you, what have you de determined to be the basis of this negative press? What was it that the royal family, perhaps more so your sister, Meghan Markle, did not want out or was afraid that you guys might mention if you were invited to the wedding, because I know that you were not invited, your father was not invited, although publicly they said he was, he wasn't invited. Right, so in the very beginning, and I've been publicly criticized, people said, well, Samantha was praising her sister in the beginning. Of course I was, I love my sister, right. right? And so I was wanting the royal family to see our family as we were and to know that Megan had moral support and that we were really behind her. Um, and then we didn't know that there was another agenda, that the media had found all of us. I was living privately under my married name, which was kind of cool. I just didn't have time to change my driver's license yet. And right. I kept it for my daughter. So to find out that um, journalists are locating us all, they've hired private investigators. They're going through the pipelines of utility bills and background searches. They found us all. And it seems like, and I didn't know right away, that there was this, like, like, like this agenda and this goal of, oh my God, They've all been found. I've got to seal off the hatches and silence everybody. We didn't know what that was about. Within a, a week of the first interview that was positive, we started seeing tabloids write disparaging articles about the family, calling my dad a deadbeat dad, saying nasty things about me, calling me a jealous hag. And then we were out there once we realized this, we were like, what are they talking about? I've got to set the record straight. So I would tweet. And I would contact them. And when they, contact, when they contacted me to do interviews, I was saying, this is true. That's not true. This is true. That's not true. And I felt like I was like on the defense about things that were not real. So that was, that was very weird. And I thought, oh, okay, but I did an interview. We set the record straight. Someone on Twitter said, Samantha, do you think they're swatting the hornet's nest? Do you think they're asking me more questions and wanting to do more interviews? so they can write more negative stories about you. And I didn't know what was going on. Um, and I found out that there was an entrenched media agenda against us because we had been located. And I didn't find that out until much later, but we were always in this cycle of trying to set the record straight. They would write more articles. The public would say, why don't the Marvel family just STFU? Like, why are they out there doing articles? They must be money grubbers trying to glom onto their sister. No, yeah. the public didn't know that people were writing negative articles. We were doing more interviews to correct those articles, not to make money. It yeah. was well, like this, this weird, vicious cycle. You were, so trying to, you, you were trying to play catch up, and it reminds me of this saying that says, a lie can travel around the world while the truth, the, the truth is still trying to put on its pants. <laughs> so you're trying to play catch up. You have no resources like your sister has. And like the royal family has, and you're like, what in the world's going on? You're turning my life upside down for what? For what reason? I love you. What are you doing this to me for? And and it was weird. And then on the flip side, we would say something in an interview, 
And then even words that we didn't say that were in bold font headlines, like the princess pushy thing or the, those were not our words, but it seemed like she was upset thinking that we said those things. And my, I had said in interviews, if you don't see my mouth move and you don't see me say it, you can't say I said it. Right. And I didn't know how aggregate news worked at that time. I didn't know about how paid PR worked. And I didn't know how powerful PR firms were at shaping a social narrative, at shaping social perception about realities, about politics, about individuals. So I between, didn't know how the game was played yet. Between the, the palace, um, I guess, PR, you know, spin. And I think you said that your sister and Harry have a firm that was representing the Clintons. And um, I don't know if you want to get into that and how you're able to make these connections and how you made these connections, that this was what was going on. It's been a false narrative about you and your father. Well, it was kind of terrifying for me as a degreed mental health counselor. And I had passed an FBI background check. So I saw an article come out that said I was on a fixated person's list. And oh my God, you know, I, first of all, I knew that couldn't be true because I had just passed a background check that was pretty extensive. So I was like, where is this coming from? Oh my God. And, and, and that was just one article. But when I Googled myself and that, and I saw it around the world, exponentially like wildfire wow. in the smallest towns, I thought, oh my God, I'm a witch being burned at the stake. What the hell is going on here? It was truly terrifying because I couldn't sue them all. I couldn't contact them all. I didn't have the energy. And more than that, I didn't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. So I got a lawyer in London who works at a defamation law firm to do some research, make some phone calls, contact Scotland Yard, contact the Met Police. And I wasn't in their database. I wasn't in their computer. That was never true. It was a PR. So it was a PR yeah. at the behest of your sister, it seems. That's what I found out. And it was reported that a protection officer of hers got it from her and then went to the London Times. Wow. But I thought, you know what? This is really demented. It has no merit. It's very cruel and vicious. It's very defamatory, very injurious. And how, how do you, I mean, as a professional, if I Googled my name or I wanted to go work as a mental health counselor and you Googled my name, to see something like that was totally a character assassination. It's, it's affected totally your whole different. career. It's affected your, your, your peace of mind, your faith, your career, everything. I mean, from what yeah, I, know, I know, if you look this stuff up, it's like you look like you're unstable until we see documents which we have now, and we spoke to you at length. Well, no, I work, you know, I think anybody who's in a wheelchair, and this is not a defense, we adapt, we overcome, life is a gift. I'm not a victim because I'm in a wheelchair, but I can say I worked long and hard in a wheelchair, getting through doors with books on my lap, you know, in between classes, really wanting to make a difference. I thought even in my wheelchair, I'll be a counselor, I'll help people, and help be their voice who may not have it because I may be, you know, I may not be able to walk, but I think God is pretty amazing. I have gifts. I have a voice. I can use it to help other people. Right. So everything I've worked so long and hard for, all of a sudden these tabloids and this PR agenda is going to take that away from me. Right. With some I thought it was incredibly cruel. Your sister, knowing the platform she has, she's an educated woman. She's very articulate as well. Then she became famous in her own right. She knows that her words, a celebrity's words, spread out and have consequences, and not all fans are stable. On top of that, she marries into the royal family. We just reviewed the wedding today. My God, the crowds. I can't even imagine how saying one thing negative about a person from somebody who's originally she was very beloved saying something negative about you, you'd have people coming out of the woodwork after you, and they understand you did. You picked up stalkers, death threats. Your sister, in my opinion, now, I understand Harry, I think it was the queen. I don't know how it all works. Forgive me, Harry, and everybody in the royal family, if, if, you know, typical New York guy, I don't know how all this works, but aren't you guys like the head of the Church of England, I think, or the, 
the, the, the queen was the head of the church. So we all, we all have a share a common faith in God, Jesus. I know you do. I'm sure your sister probably does. Harry certainly does. I've heard him, you know, discuss a few things. Why don't they look at the bigger picture and look at life as something of a matter of reconciliation and forgiveness for any real or perceived slights? I mean, I don't understand how they could sit back. They're getting demonized big time in the press right now. And a lot of this because you have the proof that what they're doing is a lie. Megan Kelly, a famous journalist, did an expose. How many lies did she catch your sister in? Uh, demonstrable lies recently? Exactly. It was more than 100. Right. And I know you you're, you have issue with about, what, about seven, eight things she said about you, at least that. Well, here, here's the thing. The hypocrisy of it all was what was so shocking. When you got two people out there who are positing themselves as ambassadors for Invictus, a right. charity that deals with disabled veterans. And, um, you know, although I was in the Air Force a limited amount of time because of MS, I was also in the Air Force. So to see them pay PR, and I heard that this was the case, to go after and destroy and defame a woman who has done nothing wrong, who is taking her degree and trying to help people in a wheelchair, in my opinion, was psychotic. First of all, humanitarians don't behave that way. If for whatever reason she believed that the media was true and that the bold headlines were true, she could have come to me and said, babe, is this true? Is that true? But to go pay PR to damage us all, to hide lies that were reportedly told to the royal family about her working for the embassy, she never did, about her getting grants and scholarships, she never did. And that's why I believe we weren't invited to the wedding because people talk. So instead of just being honest and being kind and grateful to family, it seems like the whole agenda was to disparage everybody, to hide her own porky pies. And there have been several hundred or more than a hundred that have come out um, to, you know, humanitarians. If you don't agree with someone, you engage in conflict resolution. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, 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 right, not, you say, I'm not from England, but I think that's cockney rhyming slang. For lies, porky, porky pies. pies, porky <laughs> pies. <laughs> Sorry, um, Piers Morgan introduced me to that term. <laughs> so, but you know, rather than be present in the moment and be a humanitarian who is capable of diplomacy and conflict resolution, she could have come to us and said, "Is this true? Is that true?" And we would have said, "No, that's a tabloid construct." But instead, we were being attacked in a wheelchair, you know, you know, talk about being picked when you're down and trying to get up and trying to make the most of your life. And Harry, sure. and, Harry, and Harry himself knows you're in a wheelchair, that you're completely disabled. Right. And, and yet so, he's a head of Invictus or one of the spokesmen for Invictus and you're a veteran. Um, right. Yeah. And so to make it harder on me, um, I think was incredibly cruel. And at no point was, did either of them come out and say, look, uh, you know, we see the media being really cruel to the Markle family. Please be respectful and kind to our family. They didn't defend us. You know, at one point, Harry came out. And see, this is where they can't say they didn't have the power to stop it. Right. Because Harry came out and defended Meg, saying that he felt like the media was being racist. So he demonstrated that he had the power to come out and set records straight, yet he never did that for our family. And it's like they sat there in the Coliseum and just watched us all be tortured. And you know, at no point did they stop it. That, yeah, it's crazy. You know, it would be nice if he himself, Harry, I call upon you to watch this interview and see the evidence here and hear, and hear Samantha's story because I don't know if your wife is telling you the whole truth or if she, you know, if she, she lured you in with a story or her, or her looks. I don't know any of this, or maybe you've overlooked a lot of things that are true about her past that are that are fine. If you left somebody, you overlooked skeletons and all this. But uh, the, the torture that Samantha's going through is li literally, we can feel it. When we talk to her, you know, there's upset. She's very articulate in explaining it, but there's tears because she has picked up stalkers because of the comments that your wife's been making to the media. She has been demonized completely and picked up very dangerous stalkers. And uh, it's not fair. And the issues that of, of concern that were brought up are not truthful. 
And you guys have an ability to end this. I mean, do you do you agree with bullying? Stand up against it. You know, you guys are famous. You're 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 very wealthy. You you're whole, you got teams to stop this kind of thing. You have a woman in the world you're suffering because of the comments of your wife, who actually and loved your wife. Exactly, Bill. I mean, they come out. Harry's been the first one to say that he didn't like media and paparazzi because of what his mother went through. Right. Yet not, all, not only did they watch our family be tortured and tormented and defamed, they were behind closed doors paying for it by paying PR firms like Sunshine Sack, who could be vicious, to write articles that were so pointed. I mean, I could name the publications, nine or 10 of them. I came to know which television shows were under that paid PR hub because they were all regurgitating and sharing the same nasty stories that weren't true. And then what happens with aggregate news is those publications write nasty articles and other publications around the world, whether it's you know the Times India or the smallest XYZ publication in Poland or even Newsweek, at the level of legitimate news they were regurgitating stories that were written as nasty, fake news PR stories. So too and lazy to chase down the story themselves. Well, and, and when everybody in the world saying the same thing, how can you fight that? And then it's got quotation marks. We were like, but wait, we didn't say that. Why didn't anyone ask us what we really said? Why didn't anyone ask us, oh no, you said this. Well, someone, you know, here's a light example in the very beginning, someone said, Samantha said that she had the Meg had or that Harry or Meg had a soft spot for gingers. I don't use the word gingers. That's a Britishism. Right. So you know, I I don't understand why inquiring minds wouldn't go. Well, wait a minute. We didn't see her say that. Americans don't say gingers. Paper, paper put that we, you know, use some deductive reasoning. Use what paper, what paper um, use that term? Yeah, they, I mean, use logic and reasoning skills. What, because, what, 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 excuse me, Samantha, I'm sorry. What paper used that term, ginger, and attributed those words to you? That was the sun. The sun, okay. All right, you know, I, yeah, I wrote a book that really gets into like Prince Andrew and my unfortunate relationship with Glenn Maxwell and certain things that I've seen in the Palm Beach mansion.